What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Amazon Wholesale Podcast. So this is a fun one for a couple of reasons. So my guest this week, Sean, who you'll meet here shortly, he is a younger guy. He's in his mid-20s. I think he said he's 27. But he is working a finance job in New York City full time, right? And as anybody who's worked in finance in New York City knows, that is a intense job, right? We're not talking 40 hours per week. We're probably talking more like 50 or 60 hours per week. Yet he's got a multi seven figure Amazon wholesale business that he's running literally on the side. That's quite honestly not taking him that much time out of his day or out of his week to do. So some of my favorite takeaways from this episode are how he balances his job with his Amazon side hustle, how he still has time for friends, for social activities, for going out to dinner, for going out, all that good stuff that you do when you're in your 20s. And I think he's just got a cool perspective on the business, where he's going with the business, and a lot of good, just like practical tips and practical gems for people who are in the trenches, who are actively looking to grow their business, especially those people who are working a nine to five while doing Amazon on the side. And if you guys know my story, a lot of you do, but some of you might not, is I started Amazon Wholesale on the side while I was working in corporate sales. I was a salesperson for IBM and I had a lot of free time. So I was able to build my wholesale business on the side while I was working my job and uh, eventually build that into um, you know what it is now, which is over $12 million in lifetime sales. I've been full-time with it for multiple years. And I honestly think that for me, I had to leave my job just because I was so fed up with it And I really uh, did not like the corporate lifestyle. But for others, like Sean, who you'll hear from here shortly, he said that his goal is to quit his job and he actually plans to here soon. But for a lot of people, they can they they do a great job working their job and operating the Amazon business on the side for a long time. A lot of people have no desire to leave their job and there's nothing wrong with that. So, again, I think you guys are going to get a lot out of this conversation. Listen up, take notes, listen to it a couple of times. And guys, if you like the episode, do me a favor, just leave us a quick five-star review on Apple or on Spotify, wherever you're listening to this. Or if you're watching it on YouTube, uh, feel free to leave or just like the video, right? And subscribe for more because we come out with one of these every single Wednesday and have been for the last, I think, 78 weeks, whatever episode this is. So hope you guys enjoy and I'll see y'all soon. Thanks. All right, Sean, welcome to the show, man. We've been going back and forth for a few weeks now trying to get you on here. Uh, I know you and I have been going back and forth on Twitter for a while, maybe even a year or more, probably since I first got onto the platform. And I know you're a younger guy who's got a full time nine to five job working finance in New York City, which anyone who's been there knows that's not an easy role. And you're still operating a multi seven figure per year wholesale business on the side. So wanted to welcome you to the show and wanted to kind of get into your background first and foremost. Thank you so much. Uh, really excited to be here, Corey. So my background, I would say um, from Rochester, New York, I went to undergraduate at High Point University in North Carolina, and then I graduated and started working full time. I uh, got my MBA and started my Amazon business about four years ago. So I didn't realize you went to High Point. I went to Elon, which is not too far. And uh, I had some actually quite a couple of buddies that went to High Point University as well. So you might we might even have some mutual friends there because I know we're around the same age. So that's small world. Um, But you so you took the more traditional path of you went to college, graduated, and then did you immediately go to get your MBA? Or were you working first? Can you kind of elaborate on that part? So I immediately went to go get it. I was working uh, actually with my dad at the time. So I did the PMBA. So basically you work during the day and then you go to school at night. Okay, got it. Yeah, I've got a buddy who's doing that right now here uh, in Charlotte. He's doing the same program, but with Wake Forest. And so that can be a really good way to, yeah, at least have some sort of income coming in while you're still earning that MBA. Now, let's talk about at what point did you start the Amazon business during this whole process? Did you start it in college? Was it after college? Where did that start? So I started in e-commerce um, right after COVID. So I started a PP company in Shopify. So I also started my Amazon uh, account then as well, but I didn't start uh, like actually making sales or seriously sending inventory to them until about 2021. 
Okay, so you really haven't been at it that long in the grand scheme of things. And so you're saying you got your start in e-commerce with you set a Shopify store selling PPE. And so for the listeners who aren't familiar with that term PPE, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it stands for, is it personal protective equipment? Yeah, exactly. So we were selling uh, like masks, COVID tests, and then we, I was basically just you know sitting around calling up companies, uh, asking them, you know, hey, can you, would you switch your supply over to me? Here's my pricing. Oh, that's sweet. So you, I mean, you really essentially formed a, a PPE distribution company during COVID when these products were super in demand, super hard to get. So how did that go? I'm, I've actually not, I've heard of people who capitalized on those times by selling those products on Amazon, but I haven't really heard of anybody who set up that business to be mainly off Amazon, right? Because again, you were essentially a distributor of these products as opposed to a retailer. So what did that process look like and how well did that go? So first I started uh, like importing like masks in bulk from China. I would say overall, it was like a great like introduction to e-commerce, like a kind of like boom and bust, like probably our biggest month in Shopify. We did like maybe like 120 grand. And then that's good for a new was, Shopify yeah. store. Yeah, I mean, it takes off like we had a lot of like contracts and deals and stuff that I was sourcing off and off Shopify as well. So like it really like boomed and bust, but like I like Amazon so much better because it's way more consistent and like drawing traffic to your own site is like incredibly costly and difficult. Yeah, extremely costly. And that's that's one of the reasons why Amazon is so attractive as an e-commerce platform, because we don't have to drive our own traffic, right? Traffic is built right into the platform to the tune of no exaggeration, hundreds of millions of monthly views, right? And on <laughs> across the platform as a total. And I think it's funny when people complain about Amazon fees, right? With Amazon fees typically being roughly 30% of, of your revenue. Um, but in reality, it's we're paying for those eyeballs, right? Th those do not come free because if you were selling on Shopify where you're not paying Amazon fees, you're going to be paying a lot more than 30% to get traffic to your site and to get people to convert. So that's kind of the trade off there. And I'm glad you made that point because that's really important. And I think a lot of people kind of gloss over that fact. Yeah, I think in the grand scheme of things, the Amazon fees are actually quite cheap. And right. also there's nobody who's paying less fees than you. So like essentially we're all locked into the same game when nobody has an advantage. Um, so th th the real cost just goes on to the consumer. Yep. I agree. Right. And you make a good point in the sense that like it is a level playing field in terms of everybody's paying the same amount of fees, which makes like really which forces you to create your advantages in other ways. Right. Whether it's negotiating with your suppliers to get better pricing, whether it's optimizing your inventory, making sure you're staying in stock on your best products and you're liquidating debt inventory and doing a lot of these operational things that will give you a competitive advantage. Because again, you're not going to get a competitive advantage in terms of reduced fees. Everybody pays the same fees for the most part. Right. I feel like now you're pretty much just like a supply chain company. So the more like you can optimize it or the more like you can take out middlemen, like you're a middleman, right? But you want to remove other middlemen throughout your process. And right. you can do that, but you'll be in a good spot. hundred percent, hundred percent. So this was back in 2021. You're saying you had the Shopify store, you were selling PPE, you were distributing some of these uh, PPE products to other local vendors and other local retailers. Now let's fast forward to today. So that was three years ago. What was the progression of the business over that time period? And what does it look like today? So when I first started, I actually didn't really understand IP and I got like an IP violation right when I started. So I got banned for like 13 months. Um, so and then that would have been 2020. And then now in 2021, I got it back. It took me like hundreds of emails or whatever, but then I finally uncovered it. I would say first month I did like $300. In sales, second month, I did 3000 then 30000 and that was probably at uh, 100000 a month within about a year of starting. So wait, that's crazy. You said first month was three hundred, second month was 3000 third month was 30000 So you literally 10 x each month for the first three months. And yeah, then exactly. you said within by the end of year one, you were doing 500 k a month? No, it was 100 k a month. Oh, one, okay. I see. Got it. But I mean, that's, that's another, I mean, so you went 10 X, 10 X, and then you went basically three and a half X, which yeah. all in under a year is, is crazy. So there's obviously like in order to scale that quickly, in order to scale to that level, 
there's got to be a good amount of capital involved. So for the audience listening to this, this is a realistic path to scaling. Like once you grasp the concept and once you start to have that stable of suppliers and once you know what you're doing, it's not unrealistic to scale that quickly, assuming you have enough capital, because this is a very capital intensive business. So I don't want people listening to this who only have, let's say, 3K in the bank or 5K in the bank or even 10K in the bank to think that it's realistic to scale that quickly, right? So how much capital did you have going into this phase of your business to allow you to scale that quickly? So I had like a decent war chest and uh, for my business uh, in PP, but I really just leveraged up on debt. So like I have loans right now. So for example, I'm doing about 230 maybe 240,000 a month right now i mm -hmm. have 500,000 dollars in loans right like because it's just like a simple mathematical equation like you can only make so much money with your money even if you had a billion dollars right it's still a cap on how much money you could make but it's right you can make theoretically infinite money if you borrowed like 100 million dollars or you know basically you can make your if the interest rate is way cheaper than the roi you are getting why not right Exactly. And and I think it comes down to being responsible with that, though, as you know, and I know that you're like, you're a finance professional, you're in the finance field, you understand numbers, you understand how this stuff works. So I, and I applaud you for that, right? I know you're using debt in a smart way. But I want to just, again, caution the audience that if you're not the most financially literate, or if you don't know what an interest like not necessarily what an interest rate means but if you don't understand the numbers down to the decimal and if you don't know your own numbers down to the decimal in the form of having good bookkeeping and having a good profit and loss and balance sheet then i would absolutely not take on a penny of debt so the action steps for the audience listening to this who think oh i, I want to go borrow a ton of money and just put it into inventory and scale really quickly do not do that until you have a strong financial foundation um so for sean sean for you would you say, I mean, I assume you had that foundation in place as far as you've got a bookkeeper, you're getting a profit and loss statement, you're getting a balance sheet, you know, these financial metrics, like, is that fair to assume? Yeah, absolutely. I would say that's like the, the way that I structure everything, right? So it's like when you're in seller amp, like you're doing your ROI, right? So like, I, I have a CPA to do my books, I actually hired um, on your suggestion, you know, the pivot group to like audit my accounts, because I wanted yeah. to get a score on them. Because I think it's so important with Amazon that you get accurate bookkeeping and there's real, it's actually really hard to do this. Like it's not very, a process. very it's difficult. Tens of thousands of transactions like a month. And I think especially with returns, if you're not accurately tracking them in the books, you can think that you're making a lot more money than in reality you are. So, so if you That's don't have that, you would got to get it. Yeah. That great point. Right. Because there's so much leakage in this business in the sense that, a lot of times your shipments get lost and returns get damaged and returns get lost. And there's so many moving parts that there's just one or 2% of your revenue that's going to slip through the cracks. I mean, that's just the nature of any retail business. And one thing that we do each month on the suggestion of our bookkeeper is conduct an inventory valuation. So we, I think it's like an 11 line checklist where we tell them exactly, all right, what is the value of our inventory that's at Amazon? What is the value of our inventory that we've purchased, but have not yet received? What is the value of our inventory at our prep center? And we go like line by line, where is every single thing that we've paid for? Where is it and how much is it worth? And what we find is that on average each month, sometimes, well, not on average, but I'd say some months, there's anywhere from one to $2,000 discrepancy in the inventory valuation. And that is a loss that has to go on our books. So there's plenty of months where it's like, hey, we, we had to take a, a 2K hit on our operating expenses because... Uh, because we did our inventory valuation and $2,000 worth of inventory disappeared, right? Whether it got lost on the way to Amazon, and in which case we'll probably get reimbursed for it at a later date. But these are all things that, like you said, it's like people might think they're super profitable, but they're not accounting for these, these things uh, and these metrics that a lot of people just don't think about, right? Right. They call it like the, uh, the death pile, right? Yeah, the death pile, like, and that is one of the things that we account for in our inventory evaluation. It's like, what is the value of inventory that has not yet been listed that's at the 3PL? And again, every month we look at that number and we're like, that's capital that's sitting there that could be liquidated to be reinvested, re reinvested into better products. Especially, I think there are a lot of people who like try and scale on Amazon with like thin margins and they're like, oh, well, I will build up, you know, like my book of business. 
and then I'll cut it down to the most uh, like profitable items. But you know, I just want to grow my revenue, um, and especially with those guys, like you could even be losing money. Right, hundred percent. And yeah, this is uh, relatively speaking a thin margin business. So you've got to keep your eye on every single expense and make sure that you've, you're you dialed in when it comes to your numbers. So that's just kind of both a warning for those in the audience that might not have these systems in place yet, but also a reassurance that if you do have these measures in place and you do have a strong foundation, then this is one of the, if not the best and most scalable businesses out there in 2024 for turning you know, 25, 30, 40, 50 K worth of capital into multiple six figures in sales in a relatively short period of time. So I'm glad we touched. I'm glad we touched on the financial piece there. And one of the things we discussed uh, before we started recording, Sean, is how you've got a full time finance job in New York City, which I'm sure is at least 40 hour per week commitment, if not more. Um, and you've got your Amazon wholesale business, which I think you said is on track to do about two million dollars this year. And you've still got free time for friends, family, just kind of doing what it is that you want a lot of the time. So let's touch on that and how it is that you've structured your business to allow you to not have to be operating at 24 seven. So what does the business look like from that perspective? So from that perspective, um, I have one employee uh, and his name's Rick. He's the man. He's awesome. He's out of Philippines, got him on onlinejobs.ph. Yep. Um, he basically runs the entire business with my direction. Like I will WhatsApp him and tell him, you know, give him some general guidance or I'm saying, you know, did you follow up on this? Um, but like he takes 90% of my actions. Um, so I've had him on for about uh, almost two years now. I think really just setting up your business where it's scalable, where your VA is kind of like an extension of you. And yep. he's also thinking the same, you know, he's on the same track. Um, I don't think any of those guys ever build your business, but they're great um, for like following instructions and, you know, just being an extension of you and always being present. So I would say get a VA. That's the number one way. And then really set up your own processes, document them in SharePoint, take videos. That's definitely something I learned from you, Corey. Um, and it's made uh, everything so much more seamless and easy to deal with. Your point about the VA being an, ex an extension of you is spot on because what you want in a perfect world, your VA, and when we say VA, we use the term VA, right? Just because it's something that most people are familiar with. But in reality, this is not just, these people aren't just VAs. These are legitimate employees that are handling, in our case, some multi-million dollar businesses. So I definitely want to pay them the respect that they're due by referring to them as employees. But I just use the term VA because it's, again, most people know what we're talking about. But Again, with your quote unquote VA being an extension of you, you want them to get to the point where, like you said, they're not just taking orders, they're actually making decisions the way that you would make decisions. And in my experience, my main VA, her name's Criselda, she runs the entire my entire business as well. And she is now to the point where she makes decisions the same way that I would make decisions. Because she's been with me for so long and she knows how we operate, she's able to think through the same terms that I would think through and then make those decisions appropriately. Now, obviously you and I, we're not just kind of abdicating responsibility and letting them just go off and, you know, run the show. We're constantly checking in constantly, um, I guess, recalibrating to make sure that we're all on the same page. But once your VA can make some of those decisions on your behalf, some of those higher level decisions, then that's when it gets really hands off. And it sounds like that's where you're the point that you're at now. Is that right? Yeah. So I was like reading about Richard Branson. I think he runs like 30 companies or whatever. So he yeah. has like a team of five, five executive assistants, right? And they only come to him when there's a problem. Otherwise, you know, like he's not involved. So that's why I say, you know, like keep doing this, you know, keep, but if there's a problem that you can't solve, just WhatsApp me and then I'll text you back within one second and then solve it and we'll keep going. But otherwise I trust you. Like that's why I hired you. Exactly. And that's, I do the exact same thing. And a lot of times what was kind of a game changer for me and, and just in training employees and training my team is when they come to you with a problem, you'd be surprised how often they're actually capable of solving that problem themselves. They just don't have the confidence to do that. So a lot of times when Criselda, for example, comes to me with a problem, I will just respond by saying, well, what do you think we should do? And a lot of times I'd say 60, 70% of the time, she's like, oh, I think we should X, Y, Z. And I'm like, great, then let's do that, right? That's exactly what I think we should do too. So by just asking them that question and getting them to provide a possible solution, 
and then telling them like, well, yeah, that's actually what I would do too. Then now they're a little more empowered to uh, complete, basically fix those same problems on their own without having to come to you next time. That's been a really big game changer for me. I, I don't know if you've done anything similar. Yeah, I would, I, I a hundred percent agree with that. I would say also just like fo uh, fostering like a culture of like, it's okay to go, it's okay to be wrong. Like, I'm not going to be mad at you or like, you yep. know, you have to definitely, you know, they are your employee, but you can't be like, you know, everybody makes mistakes. You just have to like understand and make sure that they're like comfortable approaching you with stuff. And then they're not going to, you know, try and figure it out forever and I waste much time. Like if you need direction, come to me, but also, um, feel free to try and solve the problem first. And, you know, I like what you're talking about, get them online, you know, ask them questions. Well, well, why do you think that? Right. And then just coach them through the problem and you'll grow them 10 X. Well, and that's a great tip, especially for folks from the Philippines, because that's just their culture to not want to bother you, not want to intrude. They want to do a good job. They want to appear competent. So a lot of times they are going to be hesitant to ask questions, especially the tough questions. So you're right. It's like fostering an environment where it's okay to make mistakes. We're here to help each other. We're here to give each other feedback. Once they are bought into that and they see that, okay, that's actually how we do things around here, then they're going to be way more comfortable in sharing those problems and in giving feedback. And that just makes them, makes them better and makes the team a lot stronger. So yeah, we're, we're on the same page there for sure. Now, I want to touch on uh, again. You you've got some of the you've got a lot of free time with which you can dedicate to friends and hobbies and just doing all the things that somebody in their twenties living in New York City would do. So, but how is that exactly right? And what I mean by that is, how do you have Rick set up, and what do you have him doing to where you're not having to put in you know two, three, four, six hours a day into this business? And you're and remind us how much you're doing per year in revenue now. Is it right around two million? Yeah. So in the last 12 months, I've done 2 million. Uh, I think I'm going to finish the year at two and a half million for 2024, because I think we have a big December. I think I projected out correctly. Nice. Um, but w what I'm doing basically to make my business scalable and not get bogged down. So basically you always want to be working on the business and eliminate working in the business whenever possible. Just, you know, like a core principle of entrepreneurship. Um, but basically, I would say uh, my most common task for my VA is creating an ROI sheet. I'll say, you know, a contact supplier, CC him on there um, for the first time, you know, and then I'll have him uh, follow it up from there on. Um, I'll just say, hey, I'm super interested in starting a uh, in partnering with your brand. I'm interested in XYZ SKU, you know, like a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand. Please let me know if there's any more um, bulk discounts or if this doesn't meet MOQ. And then he'll run that in uh, Excel. And then all I'm basically doing is like directing the capital. You're just saying yes, no, or look over there. You know, I'm not going to do any of the technical work. So that's, uh, I love how you describe that, right? It's like all I'm really doing is directing the capital. And that's how I have my business set up as well. So, Again, same way, same thing you're doing. It's like I have, if we need to contact a new supplier, for example, I have Ralph sending that opening email. And then if we get pricing, then Criselda will run the pricing. She'll put together the PO. And all I have to do is say yes, no, or change this or add this, right? And then from there, once we place the PO, they're then taking, they're getting the shipment shipped out. They're getting it sent to the prep center or they're getting it sent straight to Amazon. And then they're getting it obviously into Amazon's fulfillment centers from there. But that's a great way to look at it, right? Because truly at the end of the day, the process of buying or in your words, directing your, cap <laughs> your capital is how you make your money. That's what actually gets you paid. That is the single most important task in your business. And it's not even close. So if you can basically do what you did, which is outsource every single aspect of the business, except literally deciding what to spend money on and what not to spend money on, then like that's the most freeing you can get in this business. And then if, to take it a step further, which is something that neither you and I have done, is you could then hire you know a general manager or a CEO so that then they are now the ones basically directing that capital. And then uh, you know you're kind of whatever you want to be at that point, right? Chairman of the board or whatever you want to call yourself and, um, and really have a business that runs autonomously. So that's, that's kind of the, the path to making this business as hands-off as possible. And you run th your products through 3PLs and you have your supplier shipped straight to Amazon, which is exactly what I do, 
which is the really the only way this model works in terms of being fully hands off, right? Yeah. So you can get some nice, uh, you know, passive gain tax uh, incentives for hiring a CEO as well. But um, I was going to say, yes, yeah, sending it directly to Amazon is such a hack that I learned from you because I was mm-hmm. initially scared to, you know, tell companies that I was even selling on Amazon if I didn't have to. You know, I just say, hey, like I'm a wholesale distributor and do you have any restrictions, you know, basically fleshing out like, uh, can I sell on Amazon or not without directly coming out and say it? Because, you know, as you say all the time, a lot of companies don't want to work with like, quote unquote, Amazon sellers. Right, exactly. Um, but they've been way more open to it than like I could ever imagine. It just I'm telling you, mind. it's not people think that like people think that like 99% of companies don't want to work with Amazon sellers. And it's more like 50%, right? Like there's there's plenty out there that don't care. Right. They just want to take uh, the money on the PO, honestly. Like it seems <laughs> right. like as long as you're a big, big enough, like I get why they don't want to work with like smaller, like more annoying sellers. Like, oh, can I send it like a $1,500 PO? But yep. it also blows around how little a lot of companies that are doing a lot how little the companies know about their Amazon presence, especially for right. ones that aren't selling it directly themselves. So true. And I mean, again, your point about like a lot of companies, they don't really care that I sell on Amazon. They just want to process the PO. Now, this is definitely going to be more common when you're working with distributors, because obviously distributors, they don't own the brand, so they don't really care. They just they're there to sell product. When you're working directly with the brands, again, a lot of brands are going to be more or I guess they're going to care less about how much money you can spend. And they're going to care more about, well, are you going to sell at map? Are you going to price appropriately? Are you going to run ads? Are you going to do things to help grow the brand as opposed to just buying and selling product? And, and again, my experience has been the exact same with distributors. I talked to one yesterday where uh, he was just like, I don't care where you sell your opening PO looks like it's going to be 10 to 15 K of one brand. So, you know, let's, he's like, let me know what you need and we'll get it done. Right. Like, and another thing, I guess, in that specific scenario that helped us is a lot of times even distributors don't like Amazon sellers because they only want to buy like the top product from the brand. They only want to buy like the fastest moving SKU. Well, what helps is when you go to submit that opening PO or just even to tell them the products that you're interested in make that a pretty wide list. Tell them like five, seven, 10 different SKUs from a given brand and throw in some SKUs that are a little slower moving or they're not, you know, the top 10% of their products because the distributor is going to see that and be like, oh, okay, well, these guys are interested in carrying more of the full line as opposed to just the the hottest products, right? So maybe these guys are going to help us move some of those mid-tier products and it just helps your chances. Would you say, have you had luck doing anything similar? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say sometimes I feel bad though. Cause I'll only, I'll like, I do the same thing where I only buy like the top selling product from a company, but I feel like, um, also once you find really good products in uh, really good wholesale products, like that, you can just look on the competition or whatever, and you can get so many other ideas just by like reverse sourcing other people that are also on the listing. And then you'll get into like a whole niche and then you'll see like everybody who's in the niche because it's really not that big, right? And then you'll see there's like five to 10 other wholesale guys. And then you basically have unlimited leads like for the rest of the time. So yeah, that's such a hack. And I've, I'm doing that exact same thing right now. So I've, and I've been kind of keeping this under wraps, but I have been starting to talk about it a little more. I'm doing a 60, what, what did I say? 60K in 60 days from scratch with wholesale. So basically, and I've got it up on my whiteboard here. I'm like, how many brands have I contacted? How many applications have I submitted? How many have been approved? How many POs have I placed? And, you know, what I've found is that um, of those 16 that I've contacted, I've only opened one account and that's going to turn into one PO. So it's like for every 16 to contact, it's like one PO. But, um, you know, I bring that up because one of the brands that are like all my, really all my leads up to this point, I found a storefront on Amazon called HVAC Pros. And they're like, uh, you know, probably five to $7 million per year FBA seller. 
I took his storefront, I plugged it into Smart Scout. I see that he carries like 300 different brands and I'm just going down his list and calling the brands one by one by one. And I've got probably three or four other leads in the pipeline of those 16 that are either manufacturers reps for that category or they're distributors or they're the brands themselves that are looking like it could be a legit opportunity. And I'm going to I'm going to finish this whole series just from this one guy's storefront. And I'm like, you know, 3% of the way through it. And I've, I've got, I had found 16 qualified leads already. So like, it's, it's such a hack. It's really, once you know what to look for, it's so easy to find like hundreds of qualified brands. The hard part is, is literally just calling them on the phone and then staying on top of them. That's it. It's really, that's it. Right. Like we were talking, how do you manage your time? Right. So I see all of these guys like on Twitter, they're like, oh, I'm sourcing like all day or, you know, I've contacted like 600 brands, but none of them want to work with me. Like these are like the typical like, excuses, right? For Right. But um, if you if you do go into like a warm lead, like if you're actually like reverse sourcing, like you're saying, and you're seeing like, okay, here's my criteria, you know, Amazon's not selling it and the brand itself is not selling it on Amazon. Okay. So everyone here is a third party. You could be that third party. Like you know, it's, it's pretty simple. Yeah. That's, that's all I'm looking for. So again, I'm going through this guy HVAC pro storefront and I'm going brand by brand by brand and every single brand, all I'm doing is I'm opening it in a new tab and I'm looking for one product that meets three criteria. It's not dominated by Amazon. It has existing FBA competition, right? Meaning it's like a third party friendly listing and it's selling enough units to get me excited for most products. That's like 50 to 100 units. And for even higher ticket products, it might be 20 or 30 units, right? If we're selling selling a product for a few hundred bucks, because you're going to be making 40, 50, 60 dollars profit per unit. So really, that is my only three criteria. If I find one brand that has one product that meets that criteria, then I call them. And the reason you hear of the people that say, oh, I, I reached out to 600 brands or 600 suppliers, or I didn't find anything. It's because they're emailing them. Nobody like you, you could have one brain cell and call on the phone, 600 brands, and you're going to have like 10 to 20 profitable accounts. Like it, if you really, truly found, called on the phone, 600 qualified brands, not just any brands, you would have a probably like eight figure wholesale business. Um, and again, in my experience in the last, what, five days, I've called on the phone, 16 brands, it's resulted in one, what's going to be one PO and then three to four other legitimate leads that could pan out to be um, a five to 10K PO with 16 calls. It's just because I called them on the phone. So, and I'm not to beat a dead horse, but like, I'll be saying that until, until I don't get any DMs of people saying that they contacted 500 brands and they didn't find anything, which I feel like will never stop happening. So I'm going to keep saying that. <laughs> I get excited now when I uh, like start a brand account and they're like, oh, nobody's ever asked us to ship directly to Amazon for them. Like, perfect. Right. Because I'm going to be lower than their cost because they're all going to have to prep it. So that's how you know that you're getting in like good with a supplier that not a lot of people know about. And you're, you're right about what you said. It's like sometimes you just got to ask. Like they're like, oh, nobody's ever asked us that. Yeah, we'd be happy to do it. And it uh, most people assume that it's like, oh, I don't want them to know I'm selling on Amazon or I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want them to say no. It's like, what's the worst they can do, right? And we always frame it this way. It's like, hey, we'll pay for the shipping. If we, do you mind if we just send you labels and you can just slap them on the case packs? And, and I'd say most of the time, like a majority of the time, they're like, oh yeah, that'd be great. And sometimes we've even, again, offered to quote unquote, cover the shipping by sending them our labels. And then we've got an additional discount on the product because now they're not having to pay for the shipping because it might've been a situation where like we were getting free shipping, they were paying for it. Now we are. So now they're able, they're willing to give us an extra, you know, 5% off on the order or something like that. So it's, it's truly um, a game changer when you find a supplier that will consistently ship directly to Amazon for you. It's awesome. Yeah. I think you can also make, you can also make a few points um, with, uh, by paying via wire and asking for a discount that way. Yep. Or, I mean, if you can use a credit card, right. And they're not going to offer you a discount, then by all means rack up the points, but that's just another little easy way to shave, shave money off. Yep. So true. And I personally, I'm allergic to paying with a wire. I will never really, I'll never pay cash. Uh, 
because most of the stuff that we're like, so for example, most of our vendors don't take credit cards. So we'll have to use Melio, which charges 2.9%. But if we use a, uh, Ch what is it? Chase Inc. Business Premier, which is two and a half percent back. So then I'm getting, so I'm basically only paying net 0.4%. On the Melio fees, if I'm paying with a credit card, it's a write-off. Um, the cash back is tax-free, right? So it's basically like I got more than that 2.5%. And it nets out to be a, a huge gain for me personally and for the company. And we're only going to use Melio on products that we're making a decent margin. Like for example, yesterday we bought 90K <laughs> worth of one product. And our gross margin on that product is like 16 to 17%. So, you know, if I'm only having to pay net 0.4% to use Melio, I'm still over a 15% margin, which, which is more than acceptable for me to not have to part with that much cash right away. Absolutely. I think that's uh, really good. I think that's a well above like standard market ROI uh, in wholesale, I mean, margin. Yeah. Well, this is, I mean, this is a good product that we've sold for a while. So we felt comfortable with it and we're just like, you know, the chances of this thing going to break even are very slim. So we're willing to, again, pay the, the fee in order to not have to part with the cash and get a little bit of the cash back as a result. So, and that's definitely one of the big benefits of this business is the credit card points, the cash back and all that good stuff. Yeah, I, I have so many. I've gotten like at least twenty thousand dollars this year in cash back. Like when on vacation in Spain, it was awesome. Like if you figure out, I think the Chase uh, Business Premier one is the best. Oh, it's really. it's a hack. I mean, you those rack up so fast. And like I don't even have a very good limit on that card at all. But I've been I haven't touched a Chase point the whole year, and I just hit like I'm at like one point oh four million points or something like that. And like they're just sitting there. And the Capital One Spark cash back is, is what I will cash out every time it hits 5K. So I don't, I don't let that build up quite as much, but um, both of those point ecosystems are, are great and will pay for all your flights or they'll just put some extra cash in your pocket each month just from buying inventory. So a huge, huge perk of this business. Yeah, like so, I put it. I put it like an eighty-one thousand dollars PO on it the other day. It's like that's instantly twenty-two hundred dollars in tax-free money. It's Which, like, and, and so it goes into money. your goes into your personal bank account too. Like I want to make that clear to the audience here, right? Like, and listen, I'm not a CPA. I'm not a tax professional. I think at this point, most CPAs are in agreement that you don't have to pay taxes on cash back and on credit card points. I think that's the case. I mean, I think most of them are in agreement on that. But regardless of what you, that's the viewpoint that I subscribe to. So like you said, it's like when I get a cash back check, it's made out to Corey Gannum, not Corey Gannum's business. And I literally just deposit it straight into my savings account. Like it's free money, right? That I'm not, and I'm, God knows I'm not claiming it on my taxes. Don't, don't tell anybody. So <laughs> yeah, like but this that's is not nice financial strategy. advice, but like I don't claim it against my expenses, right? Because those right. are business write-offs anyway. So you're yep. you're better off just sending it to yourself because the Chase portal sucks too. Like you're gonna pay more on travel than if you pay you just booked it on Google anyways. So oh, so is that the yourself. case with Chase? Yeah, the the Chase travel portal is not that good. Like you oh, okay? Because I always use Amex. Right. I've always yeah. booked every flight, even if I'm not using points, I'll still always book my travel through Amex Travel. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just easier that way for me, but yeah, the chase points, it sounds like best move is what, just to take the cash back. Yeah. 100%. Got it. Nice. Well, cool. So as we, as we start to come to a close here, one of the points I did want to touch on is just general advice for younger entrepreneurs, because I know you're in your twenties, you're 27, you started this business, what, three ish years ago. So around when you were 24, that is the age at which I transitioned to wholesale. So uh, we both, I guess, technically started wholesale at the same age. So really the question is, like I said, any general advice for younger guys that are either trying to get into this business or they're just trying to get into business in general and, uh, you know, and, and might be a little stuck or unsure of what to do next? Yeah. So I would say the biggest thing in, in business is uh, persistence and longevity. So there's all these guys who are like, oh, I could, you know, I got to make like X amount of money in my first year to like keep going. Um like business, like if you want to be an entrepreneur, like you have your entire life to do it. Um, so key start now, like take the action today. Um, but also don't quit. Like if you, because you're going to eventually run into it's shit is going to get hard. And there are a lot of people who will just like instantly give up and they'll pack it in that, you know, well, Oh, you know, at least I tried. It's like, no, like if you actually try your best and you keep coming back day after day for multiple years, like you'll be really successful in Amazon as 
like there's not a lot of people who are too dumb like to conceptually like get this uh concept it's not that advanced like you're just you if you're new it could just be overwhelming there's a lot of you know uh, like jargon or phrases that you might not be familiar but you will get to it uh just like don't give up before you do get to it because it, it would a lot of people will 90 percent of people will give up i'd say like 98 percent, right and, and it really comes down to that tenacity and that persistence like you said again i mean even as i'm starting the the beginning of the 60k and 60 day challenge sitting down to make those calls i'm only doing three i'm calling three brands per day every day for 60 days i'm never doing more than three in a day right and it's it's the consistency and it's the tenacity to again follow up with the previous ones and just sit down and do the three every day and I remember yesterday I was sitting down to do this. I'm like, this sucks. Like, I, I don't want to do this. I'm like, how did I do this for months and months and months on end? And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, if I'm having this thought, you know, what is somebody that is newer to the space that hasn't had success with it? Like, it's going to be way harder for them to, to stick, stick it through because they don't see the other side. They haven't seen the other side yet. So, I mean, like you said, it's persistence, it's tenacity, it's just not quitting. And when it comes to Amazon specifically, you don't meet many people who have been selling on Amazon consistently for more than two years who are not doing it successfully. Like two to three ish years kind of seems to be the baseline for this business of like stick it out for two to three years and you're going to probably do really well with it. And that's it. And again, most people just don't make it that far. It, it sucks, but we, you know, we see it every day. And so that's all it takes is just like hang in there and learn every day and, and join a community of like-minded people and all this good stuff. So do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I just think it comes down to the hunger. Like I've taught a lot of people to sell on Amazon. Like I have a friend who's a Stanford MBA, right? And I have another <laughs> friend who, who works at like a communications company. Yeah. And the, the Stanford MBA is not nearly as good as the guy who works at a uh, communications company. And I'm like, because he is already like making so much money like uh, – at Amazon, right? He's right, a, he doesn't like need an it. edge software engineer. He's an edge software engineer being like 500 k a year. Like he doesn't care. But right. Like, uh, the smaller one is like hungry, right? And he like comes back and he's probably actually one of the best people I've ever seen like at Amazon and OA and wholesale. And it's just incredible to see like the difference because you know, the one kid on paper is technically a lot smarter, but you know, he's just not as hungry. Such good advice. Yeah, it really comes down to just like how bad do you want it? And if you've got a cushy 500k a year job working working at Amazon, then again, the chances of you being hungry are way lower. Now there are those people out there that they've got good jobs and they, they're just like, I don't care. I want something different and they're going to go chase it. But like you said, I think most people wouldn't fall into that category. And in my experience, it's the guys that didn't go to college that worked blue collar jobs that you know, did construction or like something super grindy that are like the best Amazon sellers. Cause they're like, yeah, I just, I just, you know, did it until it worked. And so that seems to be the consensus, but I, I like the way you think. I think we're totally on the same page. Uh, and I wouldn't think I would ask the audience as guys, if you did enjoy this conversation, if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, give the podcast five stars. It really helps get these conversations like the one with Sean in front of more people. And if you're watching this on YouTube, like the video and subscribe because we come out with a new one of these every single Wednesday. So Sean, with that said, man, I appreciate the time. Where can people find out more about you or where can people follow you? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my name is uh, Saxon Senior. Uh, I don't <laughs> post a ton like on social media just because I'm not uh, in the course space. But yeah, follow me on Twitter. Uh, and I appreciate you having me on, Corey. It was awesome talking to you today. I enjoyed it too, man. And guys, if you're listening to this, you can follow me on all platforms at Corey Ganim or on Twitter at Ganim Corey. So thanks, guys.